So, welcome back. We're uh, continuing on with Chapter 4, uh, Viewing and Navigation. And we're going to finish up Nav Info and uh, move on into Anchor Node next. I'd like to start today with uh, reporting uh, some new features in X3D Edit. Of course, there's Dilbert, the old feature, but it's new every day, isn't it? And there's a, there's a theory about how humor is, is really pain, a way of coping with pain. So, so he, he definitely deals with topics that are painful, not in an abstract sense, but in things that we deal with every single day. So I guess that's why I like it. Uh, new feature though, given that uh, you have a scene of interest here, if I right click and want to view scene externally, we'll see what players are installed and then we get a new feature uh, launch all players so uh, depending on the peppiness of your machine you might want to go for more than a one second time delay the idea here is to keep uh, uh, three to eight browsers from clobbering your machine by jumping on it all at once so you might want to set the two seconds to one second to two or three or four, whatever your mileage is, but I'll go with the one second here, and it seems to work. And now it's going to take the scene I had in there, and we see contact and swirl. And uh, I think when I did a refresh, it uh, it disliked my install, so I actually have the other guys installed too. But here they are, one after another, and we could see what works. Swirl is a new one. That's also a, a new feature. And if we look at some of these guys, we can see Hello World works on contact. Oh, but they didn't default to examine mode. X3D specification says if there's no nav info, default to examine rotate, since that's the most common. So they're failing to do that. Swirl, look at that. They, there's a new kid on the block, and it looks like they're examining, and also uh, the text looks pretty good in there. Uh, instant reality, yep, they got it right. They're uh, examining and the text looks good. XJ3D also gets launched externally, assuming that you've done the separate install, as with all of these guys. And then uh, they get the examine part right, but their text is vertically offset incorrectly in law. So these are all things that will revisit on uh, Sunday night down in Los Angeles. We'll be doing our first plug fest. Okay, as ever, please do uh, report any other bugs or suggested improvements you might find. Okay, so in navigation info, we have um, We've gone over the most uh, obvious parts where uh, we have uh, the type, whether we're flying, which means there's no effect of gravity, or walking, or examining, or uh, uh, allowing any of the other modes like look at and so forth. And try this again. So. Here we go. There's uh, one or two gotchas that we probably should mention. And uh, who's our scribe today? Please do make sure this gets in the minute. You have a scribe out there? Thank you, Ken. Are, are these guys bribing you to do this every day? or? Uh, uh, okay, thank you very much. we have all these different modes here. Here's a gotcha on walk. It says it allows exploration but on the ground. Uh, where's the ground? Anybody notice a ground node or a ground plane or anything? Nope. So where would the ground be? Two answers. It's, uh, uh, uh -oh. Here, to know where the ground is, if you're falling to the ground, what, what does that imply that you know? 
Gravity, exactly. And gravity is not just a value, but a vector, a direction. So I think that means we'd have to know which way is up. So to speak, yeah, which way is up? So which way is up? Y axis. Y axis. Y is up. So therefore, the ground by default would be y equals zero plane. The x y plane at y equals zero. Right there. Okay. And then the alternate answer to that is or wherever the geometry is. So for example, if you're flying around somewhere up high and you switch from fly mode to walk mode, the browser should gently bring you down until either it hits polygons, which become your ground plane, or you get all the way to y equals zero if there is no ground plane. And that's where walk should take you. Okay, and this allows us to do things like climb over terrain, climb stair steps, things like that. Okay, so there's the gotcha on walk. Where is the ground? Uh, then we did make a big point on viewpoint node. Hey, keep away from that jump field if you possibly can. It's, uh, it's rare when there are cases for using that. Uh, and remember, jump is part of viewpoint. And it's used, uh, we saw it in the elevator case where we wanted to smoothly transition and keep the user's view right where it was, even though we might be rebinding from one viewpoint to another. Okay, and, and so the jump false, which is not the default, and if you said jump false, then it would say, when I bind to that viewpoint, the camera will not move, but it's as if we navigated from that viewpoint to wherever we are. Okay, so, so a rare use case. Much more common is, how do I get from one viewpoint to another? And that's, that's the transition type. And that's probably the field that you would want to use if you want to modify that. Uh, so you animate means the browser gets to choose. Linear means straight, uh, straight line, straight averaging between positions and between orientation. Teleport means uh, what we usually call jump, or immediately snapping the camera from one view to the other view with no time delay, no navigation in between. Okay. Transition time is, uh, uh, interestingly, not a single value, but an array of values. And we provided that as an extensibility mechanism. Normally, the transition time, you would just have give it a single value, and that would be, OK, if I want to take one second or three seconds or whatever, then that's how long I'll take to get there. Why do we give an array? Well, on the animate node, remember it said here the browser gets to choose in animate mode how long they would go. Well, the browser might say, the first value is for our initial speed up, and then the second value is for how fast we might go to get there, and then the third value is for our final slowdown. But that's all speculative, though, because it is browser-specific. And so uh, that means you'd have to read the release notes if you're tied to a given browser for what features they were exposing. Will that be portable to other browsers? No. Would the first value be portable? Yes. We have said what the first value is. It's the overall time to get there. So. Uh, your mileage may vary. It's, it's a good example of how do we allow innovation and extensibility without breaking a, a baseline capability. So it's one of the nice edge cases. 
Then transition complete is an event that gets sent when you've arrived at the browser. Okay, you learn about events later, exactly how we hooked them up by a route so that we could take that Boolean. Boolean true, oh, that means my viewpoint is bound. Now that they're there, they're at the viewpoint, that means it might be the trigger to launch some behavior. Oh, now my merry-go-round will start turning because I know they're there to see it. Now my tree in the forest will fall because somebody is there to hear it. That kind of thing. All right. Now there's here's another gotcha on this. Uh, it's not a, a problem as much as something to think about. If this navigation info is bound, if this is your current navigation info, then it works for all of the viewpoint transitions that you might do, correct? For all of the navigation you might do. So you might have to think about, will my values work regardless of the combination of viewpoints? Because you don't necessarily decide. The user might be deciding which viewpoint is next. Or you might say, no, no, I am deciding which viewpoint is next. I'm going to use all those binding operations. I'm going to control, okay, first I'm taking you to this viewpoint. Then I'm taking you to that viewpoint. Then I'm going to take, it's a guided tour. I'm the author. I'm in charge. User, you're going to be hands off for a while. Okay. So the gotcha is, you have to think that through when you start flipping these switches from the benign defaults that are in there. That you might want to make sure, will it work for all the combinations, or do I take charge of my viewpoint? Okay, so those are certainly uh, considerations for somebody who's doing a really advanced demo. Okay, next piece of nav info, avatar size. Avatar size is another array of values, but this time they're not vaguely defined just to let browsers innovate, but they're very strictly defined on what they are. And, and there's really three things here. Okay, we have how far is our viewpoint over terrain? When would you use that? In walk mode. In walk mode, then you're above the ground. Okay. And then maximum step over height. That says, if we're walking, have I come up to a wall? Or have I come up to a step that I can walk over? Oh, interesting. So we can set up geometry, we can build walls that the user can't navigate past, and we can add steps that they can walk their way up to get to the next level. Yes, Ken? Hey, Ty, I have a question to ask. Yeah. If you do have a step over height, you put a step in there. Does that bump the view up by that step? Yes. It, uh, in other words, the question is, if you navigate your way over a set of steps, does that bump your view up above the step? So the answer is yes. If we're traversing our way up a stair step and we're going up, then our viewpoint as we go will remain at that height above terrain, height above the ground that we have. Okay, and then our third parameter here, or actually our zero parameter, is our collision distance. Okay, so we have collision distance is uh, not for arbitrary objects, but the collision distance of viewpoint to object. Okay, so for example, you have a set of walls and a stair step at the end, and your goal is to have the user in walk mode go down the corridor and climb the steps and see some wonderful beauty that you've created. Okay, common authoring goal. So how do we get there? Well, 
we would set up, uh, we could use these defaults. Uh, 1.6 meters, how does that sound? Do we have any uh, meter sticks here, Jeff? Uh, probably not today, but if we measured your camera, which is about eye height right now, my guess is that uh, 1.6, give or take 0.1 meters. What do you guys think? Heads vigorously nodding up and down. Okay, all in, and, and those heads, if they were standing up, would be at 1.6 meters also. Okay, so two meters, yeah, that's a little over six feet here in English terms. So, is is uh, uh, so it's less than something greater than two to six feet. Is that about where your eyeballs are? Yeah. Where did we get that number? Hmm, I'm not so sure. We might have gotten it from one of the anatomical standards, or. <coughs> Somebody might, might have just done a survey in their office. I'm not sure. That would be a good arcana history question. But anyway, 1.6 meters, we're walking along, and then we, the user, unpredictably, who knows, those wacky users, they turn sideways and they walk into the wall. Could we uh, navigate the camera to walk me into the wall? Okay, so here I am. How, how close do we want them to get to the wall? Well, if I'm, I'm this up close and personal, I'm not seeing very much, right? So what's my, what's my user experience right here? It's kind of dull. It would be reported as, uh, suddenly everything went black or white or fill in the color. Further, we might, we might actually trigger one of those things of what's called the viewing frustrum, which is the, the square camera, it's narrow here, but we have a field of view, right? 0.785, so it's from here out to our visibility limit, there's a, sort of like a rectangle that's spread out, it's a frustrum, and that's what we can see. And a little known, a little recognized aspect of that is, there is a minimum distance that the camera cuts off, so that it's not driving, it's not drawing, okay? So is there a point to drawing a wall that's that close? Oh, probably not. And if they're stuck there, they would go, they wouldn't say, oh wow, my gosh, I'm stuck against the wall. They might not see anything. They might go from all I see is a steady color that gives me no orientation, no guideline about where I am, all the way to um, inside the view frustrum, the 3D render engine is cutting off what am I seeing? And all I get is blackness. Now, as the author, you wouldn't hear all that. You may hear nothing. And it might just go away. Or if they fed back to you, well, I was walking along and suddenly everything went black. Okay, dear author, how do you debug that? You say, oh, well, what happened to your machine? You know, did it fail? Did, it, did you have to reboot or what happened? No, okay, so hopefully now you see why do we have these parameters. So if you're worried about that, and you probably should be if you want to, be, to have a good user experience, test it. Say, well, what happens when I walk into the wall? Well, 0.25 meters. Oh, okay, that's right about here. That means my camera to object collision distance, I will not get past that. Oh, I see, there's, there's a wall here. I need to rotate around. Oh, now I can start walking again. I can move down the corridor. I can, I can climb the stairs and see your beautiful scene. Thank you so much. Okay, so that's why we set these different values. Could we have given each one its own unique name? I guess so, but they didn't. And so here's what we got, it's an array. It's an array of three values. Which one is which? Well, this chart tells you. Also, the tooltips tell you. And, well, let's do a spot check on X3D Edit. Let's see if X3D Edit tells us. Somehow I jumped to the wrong page. Now I'm navigating. Navigating 
getting my slides none too successfully okay navigation info avatar size finally we can get out now x3d edit thank you Scott Adams all done for today navigation info scene edit mode edit element navigation info okay here we go so there is our transition type it gets that avatar size here they are mouse over hey tooltip okay so we did copy over the tooltips and say collision distance viewer height above terrain tallest height the viewer can walk over. So you do have some prompts in there to help you remember which is which. Okay. So there we go on, uh, on avatar size and the rationale behind it. So one more thing then is uh, visibility limit and this describes how the uh, view frustum works. Ken, a good thing for uh, the, the notes for today is let's add a picture of the view frustrum and I'll draw you a terrible one right now okay if that's our local view then that's our far view And the hidden lines in the sense of okay small camera at the beginning field of view angle out large thing out to visibility limit so where would our visibility limit be it would be right there and where would our near frustum be compared to the user's eyeball answer on the previous slide right there it would be at the uh, allowed collision distance which is also the, the near view of our view front if I'm not mistaken we'll check that okay so in the minutes we'll say let's get a diagram to help illustrate that okay now you can set it to visibility limit equals zero which means draw as far as you can all right, well, that's pretty far. Will it go forever? Well, I think the browser gets to decide. And there's actually a, a good ratio limit here. Uh, that I first got uh, when, I, when I went to a course in Silicon Valley about Open Inventor. David Marsland, great guy, great course up at Silicon Graphics. But gosh, that was a, a number of years ago. And he had this excellent thumb rule that said, how do you avoid round off error and an artifacts called aliasing where we see things tear or not this is a good way to do that okay and we can still suffer from aliasing in there so let's pull up an example for that hopefully I'm in the right directory there it is the aliasing example if we open that and expand, look at this closely, what do we have? Well, we have a box, and then we have another box. And if we look at the transforms, we see that they're almost exactly in the same place. One's a little bit to the left, and the other's a little bit to the right. Let's, uh, let's look at that. And let's examine this. And I think you can see as I zoom in and rotate this guy, we get tearing. Why is that? Because it's exactly coplanar polygon. These two boxes are exactly <coughs> overlapping. We pushed them a little left to the little to the right, so you can see the red box and the right box on either end. But 
oh, we're looking deep into the curious artifacts of the hardware on my machine right now, which may vary on your machine. Okay, so we're seeing on a basically on a pixel by pixel basis the graphics card thing, which polygon is closer of those. And so whenever it's flashing from one to the other, that means, oh, for this pixel, the red polygon won the round off error fight. For that pixel, the blue pixel, the blue polygon won the round off error conflict in these things. Okay? So, first way to avoid aliasing, don't do coplanar polygons. You can't have two things in the same place anyway in the real world, so why would you draw that? Second is, to round off error, close enough might not be good enough. How do you avoid close enough errors? Right here. If you follow that thumb rule, and you can probably get away with pushing that to 100,000 in most cases, then you will avoid round off error, even for very large scenes. In practice, that's a tough number to achieve, so it may take some judicious modeling of how far is my near view frustrum collision distance. You might not want to give up some of that ability to see within the few first few inches because you don't care about that, and that will let you see farther without the problem. Okay, I think we've looked at the uh, interface pretty closely, so everything's exposed there, everything works, plus we have our tooltips. So there you go, navigation info, and also documentation on our aliasing example. Okay, new node, one we've seen a few times in class, and now we'll study it, and that's the anchor node. Okay, so uh, Anchor was one of the very first nodes we have. This is part of the motivation for putting 3D on the web. It's, well, if I got some 3D, I can get more 3D. And let's pull it in. As opposed to writing a program that's just pulling stuff in off the local disk. So because it was motivated by web, our exemplar was not in 3D world, it was in HTML. Web pages. Oh, web pages can link to another. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we had 3D web pages? Answer yes, of course. Here's part of the part of the solution. Anchor. Okay. So our anchor instead of HTML, which would let you wrap text or an image as a linkable, clickable, selectable object to jump you to another web page or jump you to the image or play a sound or whatever, we use the same notion, an anchor tag. We spell it all the way out, and in HTML it's simply called A for anchor tag. We say anchor, and then we wrap that around whatever you got. Geometry, a shape, something, and that says if the user selects it, if they click on it, then it will jump to wherever you tell it to go. Okay, and wherever you tell it to go could be another 3D scene, or another uh, HTML page, or an image, or one step further, a viewpoint in your scene, so you can navigate within the scene and make, say, perhaps a road sign that says, click here for the first viewpoint, click on this road sign for the second viewpoint. It might not say that. It might say, uh, Canberra, 6,000 miles, and you click there, and we go or uh, whatever, but that's your choice as an author. So let's look at the interface for Anchor. Okay, we've got this queued up. Here's our Anchor scene. So what does it say? It says, click orange text for Monterey Bay Aquarium. Okay, so let's launch that. Let's put it in the web browser. All right, click orange text for Monterey Bay Aquarium website. So I put my mouse over it, I hope. Trying to get a little closer, maybe not too close. I'm 
in examine mode, let's switch to fly mode. Fly up close so I can get a nice clean click on that. And, oops, no joy, what happened here? XJ3D doesn't seem to like external link. Correct, yeah, XJ3D uh, does not launch an external browser. So this one is launching an external browser. How can we say that? Well, let's, let's dissect it. We'll go edit the anchor tag. And we say, okay, there's the URL. There's the description. Oh, and we've added a parameter here, and we can see uh, there's a tooltip that it tells you how to launch that. Let's read some more about the tooltip, and we'll go to the help page. What does it mean to have a parameter? So for anchor, Where we go? Okay, uh, parameter, there we are, parameter. Pass parameter, and it gives you a few here. So target equals blank will load the HTML, will load your target URL into a blank frame, meaning a blank web browser frame. Okay, so if the application you're using doesn't talk to the external browser, then you've got a problem. So maybe that's our issue with both. I thought this one worked on there, so that's kind of curious. So we've maybe uncovered a problem, and I should probably try linking uh, a different browser in my website. So apologies for that today. I had tested that before. In fact, I tested it yesterday, so I'm not sure what changed on my machine. But that's the idea. So this, this anchor was very simple and it showed, well, yeah, we did create a road sign and we made it basically a text node. And with that anchor as uh, the parent, it affects all the geometry that's inside it, all of its children. Okay, now to make the text a little more clickable, you can see uh, that we put another trick in here too, uh, right after that. And um, basically, I put a box around the text. Okay, so here's our box, six meters wide in the x direction, two meters tall in the y direction, only 0 0.02 deep in the z direction, and then transparency equals one. Oh, that's how we say invisible. So we put some invisible geometry around that text and that's clickable too. So that means, should it work in the first darn place, uh, my, uh, yeah, see, this browser is definitely having problems right here. So we'll try a different plugin and try it next time and it should work just fine. But that's a nice trick to make your text signs more clickable. You also might put a box as a background color if you want to have different contrast so that it's readable. Okay, um, let's see what else we have on Anchor. And it's unfortunate I uh, garbled my install on here because it would be nice to see this next feature. Um, description. Description. Well, you know, I'm always a big fan whenever there's a description tag because it tells the user what happened. Click here to crash your machine. There, now, there's a helpful description. Maybe we should put that in there. But there's some better ones here. And what should happen with that description is when you put the mouse over the clickable geometry, such as that text sign, it should pop up your description so that the user gets a cue. Oh, this is what's going to happen. Okay. Fair enough. And then URL. URLs are very interesting. This is how we do URLs and everything. We don't have a single value URL like HTML, but rather we have an array of them. Or precisely that array is an ordered list of URLs. 
and that lets you put in more than one address so that if the first one fails it can go to the second if the second one fails it can go to the third and so on and we see that that's a, a more robust way to make sure content works okay so it's a good way to uh, have local addresses or online addresses like you may say well look look in the same directory for the for the image look in the same directory for the scene to put in otherwise go to the website where you know it exists you can also flip that around sometimes if you say well I want to show the weather you might want to first go to the online site but if the user is offline if their machine is not connected rather than show nothing you might want to go to your local version of here's a bright sunny day okay so this is very nice flexibility and in, in, in my opinion uh, something where X3D got it even better than HTML because we, we give you more flexibility the parameter this is modeled again directly after HTML when you click on different pages you can go to different frames send content to that we have the same ability so if your X3D browser is a plugin within an HTML page this is how you would jump to different frames or jump to a completely new window. Uh, in other words, by launching them, you would retain the original scene where it was, and the browser should send it elsewhere. So for a standalone browser that doesn't understand frames or HTML or any of that, I would expect it to simply do that in place. Okay. Hints and warnings. Uh, uh, you always have to be careful about website addresses. Uh, capitalization specifically and most people don't worry about this because most people are not building servers but if your your content is going on a server and being accessed you know your anchor link goes to something else you did then you want to make sure you're pointing to the right place and uh, Unix systems Mac Linux and also web servers the HTTP protocol even if it's running on a Windows machine they are all very strict about capitalization of directory names and file names. Windows systems are not. So if you're looking for a local link on your local directory system, it'll work. And you go, well, isn't that nice? It's, it's fine. And why would I ever have to worry about that? The answer, if you push your content up to the server, it suddenly won't work because you mistyped the directory name or it just got changed and you're capital letters are no longer correct okay so it's actually a bad thing because the error you don't want is the error that only your users experience because then you can't fix it okay so that's why please be extra careful and test when you push it up to a server to make sure that things still work also sometimes we need to use escape characters in other words how do we prevent the special characters from getting interpreted as special characters and just being used as what you want so sometimes you have to resort to these guys ampersand amp ampersand apostrophe etc so there are examples in the book on how to do that and also uh, I think in the notes for this page Okay, there was our anchor scene, and there was what we should see and what our editor showed us. Because anchor is uh, similar to the other grouping nodes, we also have our bounding box values that we saw in the other grouping nodes. And there are tooltips. Okay, so today we finished up anchor. Oh, excuse me, Navi we finished up navigation info and we went through Anchor, one of the critical things. Tomorrow in the next lesson we're going to go through Billboard and Collision to finish out <coughs> Chapter 4. See you then.